Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and welcome to today's webinar on bloggers and their role in the dissemination of scholarly information. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to get us started. Um, today's webinar um, will be recorded. Um, this is the uh, agenda that we'll be running through, so I'll introduce our speakers in a moment. Um, we'll talk through quickly Altmetric's blog, blog tracking and the work that we do here at Altmetric. Um, and then we'll hear from Rolf Deegan on science writing, Neuroskeptic on his blogging, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, my name is Kat, I'm the CMO here at Altmetric. Our webinars normally run much more smoothly than this, so you get a, a special experience today. Um, and I'm going to introduce our speakers. So um, I'll give a brief introduction, and then first up speaking, we'll have Rolf Deegan. Um, Rolf is a freelance science writer living in Bonn. He's authored many popular science books, including Cat Sense, a book on common human psychological fallacies, and a book whose English title is The End of Evil. He maintains an active Twitter account and has been an interviewee for Retraction Watch blog, for which he is often credited as the source of many retractions. After Rolf, we'll be hearing from Neuroskeptic. Neuroskeptic, as many of you may be aware, is an anonymous blogger for Discover Magazine and PLOS Neurobiology. He's a British neuroscientist who has previously spoken at the Altmetrics Conference in 2014 and is a really active tweeter. So just to kind of start with a bit about the, the background to all of this, um, many of you will be aware that at Altmetric, what we do is track the online attention surrounding research. And to do this, we track a number of different sources, including news outlets and policy documents um, and places like Wikipedia and YouTube. But a big part of what we do is tracking blogs for mentions of research. And this is really to show how active bloggers like Rolf and a neuroskeptic are engaging with the research and, and what they think about it and what they're telling their readers about it. Um, we really see metrics as a complement to existing metrics. So you'll all be really familiar with things like the H index, traditional citations, um, time to publication and reject, rejection and acceptance rates. Um, and we're all well aware of the issues that metrics come with. So, for example, citations often have a very long lag time. They take months or years to accrue. Um, and they're also really focused on a niche audience, and they're only reflecting the, new, the views of that niche audience. So really what we're trying to do with Altmetrics is expand that and to help demonstrate what other people think of the research beyond the academy. The blog tracking that we do here at Altmetric is already fairly extensive. We track over 10,000 blogs. Um, and to date have picked up over 1 million mentions of individual research items within those blogs. So there's an awful lot of activity going on online that we're surfacing through our data. Um, and our tracking goes way back to 2006. So if you look in the Altmetric database, you can find mentions of research from blogs in 2006. And what are all those bloggers talking about? Um, interestingly, um, blogs and, and science writing in general have become a uh, really important forum for generating cost in research. So to know that you know the research you're looking at has been independently verified and that people are really questioning, you know, how is this research being done? Are the practices behind it legal? Are they moral? Are they valid? Um, blogs are doing an awful lot to expose all of that activity and to really question what's going on there. And the role of research commentary plays a pe heavy part in the public understanding of science and research. So some of the articles published are obviously fairly technical in nature or can be quite on quite niche subjects. And when you bring in the research commentary, it can really help expose that research to a broader audience who perhaps need it explained in a more plain English way or could really do with the critical viewpoint of someone who understands what's being discussed in the item. And the blogs that we're talking about, of course, certainly the ones we track at Altmetric, really vary in style and type. So some of them are newspaper hosted. Um, for example, we have the example here from the Washington Post, their Wonk blog. Um, on the whole, these blogs tend to be editorially separate from the newspaper stories that they exist alongside. They often sit on a subdomain of the newspaper and they'll have a large audience, but regular updates and content that can often be more news focused. Another type of blog that we track, for example, is public education. Um, so these will often sit on an independent domain. They'll often be written by specialists, such as scientists or people who are experts in their field. And really, the main goal of these blogs is to educate a broader audience. So they tend to have more of a social media presence, 
um, and a large but specific audience. So, so they're really aiming to communicate research beyond the academy um, to people who are interested in it and want to be engaged, but also want it translated for them. Um, another type is blogs posted by research groups at universities or academic institutions. So you'll often find that a lab or a department will have started a blog to help tell a much broader audience about their research. So they're often used as an outlet to promote their own group's work. They'll have a fairly narrow focus a lot of the time. They'll focus just on the work that's going on in the lab. Um, and they really act as a way for, for that research to be easily communicated to the wider world without them having to reach out to press outlets. Um, and it's a really nice way for a lab or a working group to kind of um, build their online presence and to help them engage with that wider audience. Um, and then, of course, you get the research blogging platforms. So, like, we have the science blog platform here. Um, these will be a large collective domain, so they're aggregating lots of different blogs. The audience of these, specifically, especially ones like science blogs, can often be researchers. It, you know, there may be other interested people reading it as well, of course. Um, but it really helps build that community. So it helps researchers, researchers, for example, discover new blogs in their discipline that they might like to read, um, or even ones that might be interested in featuring their work. So authors could be looking at trying to identify blogs to reach out to with news of their latest publications. So that's just a quick update on the things that we do here at Altmetric with regards to blogs and the, the kind of things that we're talking about when we talk about a blog. Um, we're now going to hear from Rolf on his experience as a science writer, um, and he's going to share what for him has been important in terms of communicating research. So Rolf, I'm just going to switch it now to make you the presenter, and if when the box comes up, you could select to share your screen, that would be brilliant. Let me just do that here. Oh, my computer is having issues once again. Um, here we go. Okay. Is the box popping up? Yes, it's up. Okay, I can start now. Perfect. So, do I start now? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you, so please do. Okay, hello people out there. Glad to meet you. Glad to meet Altmetrix. I want to start this with thanking Altmetric for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. And I want to tell you that the name Altmetric has become an important roadmap for me during my work. I am deeply uh, after great new unused science stories, which must be completely new. So I always look after um, Altmetric because it tells me if there has been already some other people, if other people have beaten me. So my main job now is beating Altmetric. So I'm a science writer living here in Bonn in Germany and living by science writing since about 1980. I have written articles for all great and major newspapers and magazines in Germany and have written several books. When I started doing this, I felt incredibly privileged. I thought, how can it be possible to make a living by writing and thinking about the great questions of life? Who am I? How did I become that way? Why am I not Brad Pitt? The irony about this thing was I didn't know it at that time. I was lucky and it was a privilege and it would end. Because 20 years into the business, the disruptive effect of the internet began to start. I, be, um, I noticed that the uh, calls from the newspapers and magazines became less and less. They started to fire freelance writers. Some big newspapers in Germany now have fired all their freelance writers. So let's take a look at the American statistic. As you can see here, the number of weekly science sections in newspapers has dropped from, 59, from 95 in 1989 to 19 in 2012. And the trend is increasing. People in the scene are making fun and saying in a few years 
we will bring the, the last printed copies of our newspapers to the retirement homes, to the few people who will be reading them then. Um, but, but my problem was I have al always been compulsive about searching science studies. I get hundreds if not thousands of table of contents alerts daily. I scan abstracts on science magazine, I scan websites, and I have many, many subscriptions and free at, uh, access to science journals. And this could be a public service. I could make people learn a lot which they couldn't learn themselves. So at some time, I noticed that I could do my work on the internet. There were great models like Neuroskeptic who showed me how one could do this. And in the beginning, I thought I could make science journalism the old way. I could write nice, great features with a lot of background material. And uh, at that time, I thought I would write these great uh, features on a blog and use Twitter only to make people, only to alert people to my great um, features and articles. So I started writing great blog posts and I also started tweeting about it. And I tweeted and I waited and I waited and it was very disconcerting because people, they liked my tweets, okay, and they even uh, retweeted them, but nobody seemed to visit uh, my blog posts. Um, I have won the impression that people on Twitter are a bit lazy. They don't have the tendency to follow through with links. They want all the information on the Twitter stream and, and at and the time I noticed this, I, I knew I must change my way. I had to, to find a way to to force people to read my information. So I started doing my screenshots. Um, and but this, this was only uh, a, a fast try at the, at the beginning, but after a while uh, I became addicted to this. This is a great challenge, trying to um, compress the complexity of a great science story within a screenshot which has perhaps 1,000 characters. And uh, as a journalist you may like this because um, this is also a bit like poetry where you always have to press a lot of information in a few beautiful words if you manage it. Um, about the subjects, I have learned a lot in, in the time between. Um, for example, it turned out that bad is good generally. People comments. They like it when classic studies are torn apart and um, they like it when great names were put into disrespect. And uh, another thing that was a, bit, uh, a little bit um, that I didn't expect was uh, in journalism they classically say sex sells. But I have won the impression on at least in connection with science reporting sex is not such a big topic. Uh, tweets about research on sexuality in general don't make a, a, a lot of traffic. Uh, I have also noticed that a lot of journals and magazines make use of my tweet information here in Germany, but they always never mention my work. Um, as many people have discovered some years ago, there is a deep crisis in science. Science, especially psychology, is in crisis because it has a skeleton in the toilet. Many, many, many studies do not reproduce 
many has to have to be retracted, many are contaminated with questionable research practices. When I discovered this at the first time, it was like a personal humiliation, because all the great articles I had written in earlier years were at least partly based on falsehood, on lies, and on corruption. And I, it is sad to, to, to talk about this topic, because I have always had a lot of fun in speaking with other people personally about science result. And I have always been kind of like a teacher who always taught people about new results. And it is a bit humiliating now meeting these people and telling them, yes, half of what I told you uh, was not just right. And here is the, the, one of the most important things. The traditional media, the press, they mostly do not cover, cover the dirty side of science. And um, I have to show you a slide about this. Um, yeah, yes. there was recently a study that showed that only about half of the biomedical studies that are reported by newspapers are later confirmed by other research. Most of the studies who were disconfirmed were never mentioned in the media. But that means you, if you're reading the classical media, you will not hear a lot about dirty sides of science. Why is that so? This has a lot to do with the fact that the media get most of their information uh, from uh, press releases from big science institutions, for example, from the big journals like Science or Nature, from the university, and from, the, uh, and from other science organizations. And those organizations are not in the business in, of reporting about their failures. Also, most retractions and failed replications are not published in those big science journals, but in less glorious journals, which do not emit um, press releases to the press. And um, this another slide, the same thing is about current criticism of science. Uh, recently, a research uh, showed that uh, the, all the trouble with stem cell research in the STAB case was first covered on Twitter and much later in the classical media. As you can see, it erupted in Twitter and the, the classical media only followed up much later. This, this, has, this is tendency has become worse uh, as the, most of the media have fired their freelance science writers who did research on those topics. And another question is, will social media be able to compensate for uh, the crisis in the media? Will, will they be able to replace the shortcomings of the reporting in the classical media? A lot of people say, no, uh, the social media don't have the kind of quality control that is necessary for this. See, um, they, see they think that only uh, professional journalists have the ability to control the quality. From my own experience, I can say this is not true. I have never felt that controlled as I do nowadays on Twitter. Many of my highly intelligent followers are professors, statisticians, bloggers, critical eggheads. If I do something wrong, I'm toast. They will instantly criticize me. They will instantly show uh, my errors. I have actually become much more cautious than I was at my, in the old days at the media. At that time, I could tell my editors fairy tales. Most of them did not know anything about the actual research I reported about. There were no experts in my field. 
And um, when it was published, anyone who wanted to criticize this would have had to write a letter to the editor. And at that time, most journalists laughed at this kind of letters. So I have to say um, uh, the problem, the, the quality control is right now for me a much, much more stronger than it was earlier. On a personal note, uh, in, um, at the beginning of 2000 and the following years, I had a lot of trouble making my living in, in, in science writing because, as I told you, the, there were very few jobs from the media. Uh, books, uh, the, the book selling is also not as good as it was at that time. And But I have, on a personal note, I had a great luck. I met a great German um, a comedian and physician Eckert from Hirschhausen, which became my friend, who became my friend, and this is a, the greatest comedy comedian right now in Germany. And most of his comic stuff is about science, and he has developed developed an appetite uh, for psychology. And now I'm kind of a science advisor for a comedian, which is which looks like a great job description and I can tell you that um, looking for science which is good for comical use is a, quite another thing. I ha you have to look for comic potential in new studies. I w I w I, I'd like to give you an example. Uh, uh, recently, or it's already a few years ago, I found a study which seemed to show that drinking alcohol makes you conservative. I, it, they had studied uh, people in the pub with a breathalyzer and given them a questionnaire. And th those people who had drunk more made more uh, conservative comments. And in the same moment, uh, I read that study, an idea formed in my head. I, I thought, oh my God, this means all my colleagues in the media are conservatives at night. And here is another um, personal note. In, in the old times, science writing was about the big big subjects, as I told you, the big existential topics like who am I, how do people become the way they are, why are they different, why are they the same. And since the crisis in psychology and in science in general has started, uh, we don't have the privilege any longer to talk about only about these big subjects. We have also to talk about little subjects, for example, what goes wrong with these studies? How can you do it better? How can we uh, prevent questionable research practices? And I, um, the media, the, the classical media don't like to uh, publish these kind of questions. Uh, they have also a publication bias uh, which prefers good sexy stories, but criticism, especially criticism of method, methods, is not sexy. But the social media and science reporting on Twitter and, and on other media has created something which is very, very good for science. It has created like an acquired taste for criticism. In the old times, I only had fun when I found a big, big new study which had sensational new results. Today I have at least the same fun when I find a big, big study which um, falsifies an old story. And I think this is um, right now one of the most important things that people have to learn. That it can be the same fun to criticize stuff and to find error in something as to find great new insights. Hey. Lovely, Rob. Thank you. Is that the end of your presentation? I think, yeah.
Okay, perfect. It was, it's really interesting to hear about all of your different experiences. And I certainly never thought about trying to find science uh, for a comedian. So that must be quite a unique experience. Um, I'm going to hand the presenting over to Neuroskeptic now, who will share um, some of his experiences with being a science writer. So Neuroskeptic, you should see something pop up on your screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you see this? Okay. Uh, we can't just yet. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yep, all good. Can you see it? Great. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, thanks very much um, to Cat and to everyone at Altmetric for, uh, for hosting me. Um, and thanks to you all for listening. Um, today, um, I'm going to talk about my experiences as a science blogger. So, I guess as one of the producers of the blog posts that go into make Altmetric, um, and also as a as somebody who tweets uh, about science quite a lot. Uh, so, as a sort of um, as one of the um, creators of the Altmetric score, if you like, one of the um, uh, subjects. Um, and I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the history of uh, science blogging and how I see science blogging um, as being different to uh, science journalism and how, and, and the sort of unique characteristics that um, the blogging has that makes it special. Um, so uh, this is just a little um, uh, Google snippet, uh, if you type in blogs are into Google, I find this is quite a good way of sort of gorging popular opinion on things. Um, so if you type in blogs are, there's a few negative uh, things that people think. Blogs are dead, blogs are dying, uh, blogs are stupid, um, and there's not very really much positive stuff. Um, but I think that um, blogs have become such a big part of the uh, the media um, conversation or ecosystem uh, that the, they're almost become um, it, people. Are, my my impression is that people are talking about blogs less and less uh, these days, even though blogs are everywhere and they're um, <clears throat> and they're still going strong. I think blogs have almost become an accepted part of um, of the media in a way that they weren't. Um, 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, and so I remember um, 10 years ago, people were talking about blogs probably more because they were a new thing, but now they've become, um, uh, they've become an accepted thing. So I don't think it's really true that they're dead or dying. Um, and some of you may have seen this if you were on Twitter yesterday. Um, this is um, a sort of overview of the science journalism and science blogging world. Um, now, this is supposedly called an infographic. Um, it's not really an infographic, it's just someone's opinion that they've made into a graphical form. Um, and it's basically their opinion on how different sites, um, which ones are more scientifically rigorous um, than others. So on the left, you've got the sort of scientifically rigorous ones. And on the right, you've got um, the sort of bad science crap. Um, and then at the top you have sort of what they call compelling, so basically sort of actually interesting stuff, and the bottom is kind of boring stuff. So it's very much opinion based, as I say. It's um, just one person's opinion. Um, but it's interesting to me that a lot of these uh, a lot of these sites have their own blogs attached. Um, so just off the top of my head, you've got Guardian have a lot of blogs, um, uh, New York Times, um, uh, Big Think, Slate, Discover, of course, which is where I'm blogging, Wired, and in fact, and, and many others. Um, they have they have blogs in the sense of regular contributions from the same person or the, or a small group of people um, that they host to talk about science. Um, and um, yeah, so it, it's it's striking that this wasn't the case five years ago or certainly not 10 years ago. So I started blogging um, 
in 2008. Um, this is my first ever post, and this was hosted at uh, blogspot.com. And so this was an independent blog. It wasn't um, it wasn't associated with anyone. It wasn't hosted by anyone, apart from Blogspot, which was which is a generic sort of anyone can create a blog there and do anything they want. Um, so it was it was a purely independent blog, and at, at that time. Um, there were not, there were quite a few, well there were not as many science blogs as there are today, but there were quite a few, um, and most of them were independent, um, and they weren't associated with sort of mainstream media um, outlets in any way. Um, most, most blogs back then were independent. Um, the, there was one, um, there was one site which was uh, sort of the hub for Many of the biggest science blogs, which is called uh, called scienceblogs.com, um, it's still around, although it's um, nowhere near as influential as it used to be, because at the time, so this was back in sort of 2008, 2009, uh, really it hosted all the major science blogs in the world, um, and it had I don't know like 150 blogs I think at its peak um, or more, um, and. It was so, as I say, it was a huge, um, a huge thing. But it's interesting that again, that it, it was a separate, um, it was its own site just for science blogs. Um, so science blogging was really its own sort of closed world. It wasn't integrated with uh, the rest of the media, um, uh, the rest of the media uh, newspapers um, and magazines. Um, now, science blogs, as some of you may know, um, kind of had a scandal. Um, back in 2010, there was um, there was it's called Pepsi Gate. Um, essentially, it was about Pepsi wanted to start a blog where they would share their own uh, research, and a lot of people thought that was um, uh, you know basically going against the uh, independent um, and objective uh, ideals of science to have a uh, a company essentially buying. A blog and paying to have it hosted and then have their own um, uh, expressing their own views. Uh, so a lot of people left science uh, scienceblogs.com, and I think that was perhaps the start of the sort of mainstream um, mainstreamization, if you if that's a word, of, um, of science blogging. Um, because now there were lots of uh, successful bloggers that didn't want to be associated with uh, scienceblogs.com. Um, so they had to have somewhere else to go, and they went, um, well, sort of, in a nutshell, uh, they went to a number of different places. Some people went to sort of science magazines like um, uh, Scientific American and New Scientist. Um, but from there, they um, found themselves, I guess, scattered across um, across the, the whole media ecosystem. So today we have something like um, The Guardian, um, and it has a number of science blogs. So one of them, which I read quite often, is called Headquarters. Um, and so this is about psychology and neuroscience. And it really is, um, it's a blog in the sense that it's, um, it's got some, it's a small number of, um, of individuals who are writing about what they're interested in. Um, so this is how I would distinguish between a blog and a sort of science journalism. Um, in the sense that a science journalist is likely to be a generalist. Um, most science journalists, they will have a science background, but they won't necessarily be writing about things that, they, um, that they're that they particularly specialized in or they're particularly interested in. Um, whereas a blogger is likely to only write about things that they're familiar with or that they're particularly interested in. Um, so a blogger is more of a sort of niche um, content creator, if you like. And very often, bloggers will be active scientists, um, or at least will have done active research um, uh, in the um, in the field that they're writing about. Um, so, in that sense, blogging is um, is a different uh, perspective. Um, even though, as we even though as we can see, um, blogs sort of end up. Um, and, and from the reader's point of view, there might not be very much difference between a blog post and a news story. These days, they can be almost indistinguishable. They'll be hosted on the same 
um, if we host it on the same site, they'll look very similar. Um, so the distinction between blog and other forms of writing is almost um, is is fading away. Um, but I think there is an important difference, and the difference is in how that that material gets written, and the fact that it's written by a sort of by a specialist with a special interest, uh, and that's what makes a blog a blog, in my view. Um, so, how does this um, how does this sort of what does that mean when, when it comes to how blogs um, communicate um, communicate science? Um, so, I think that sci um, Blogs um, are active. Bloggers are active scientists. Um, so, in a sense, blogging is a more direct method of um, communication. It, so, a blogger will usually, or almost always, not be um, be going via a press officer uh, when they're writing, when they're communicating. Um, so, blogging is a direct means um, by which scientists can communicate, and it's often a means by which um, a sort of insider perspective on the research uh, is made available to the public. Um, so actually, Rolf earlier mentioned about the Staps, the Stap cell scandal, uh, and how it was um, people on Twitter who first became um, first became suspicious that there was something uh, wrong with this this story. It was two actually two papers in Nature published together. Uh, it was huge. Um, Huge publication, uh, but it turned out um, pretty quickly that there were big problems with the data, with the with the idea of this stat phenomenon, supposedly a way of making stem cells very quickly. Uh, but it turned out that there was a big that there were big problems, and um, eventually the papers were retracted, and the uh, the lead author revealed that she'd um, been manipulating data. Um, but it was. Um, people on Twitter and on blogs um, who were first raising the alarm, and many of those were themselves um, scientists. Uh, so I think without, you know, maybe if you, if you go back to 10, 10 years ago, um, these same scientists, they would still have been raising concerns, but they'd have been raising them in private within their own coffee areas, if you like, um, just talking to their own colleagues. Um, but now this sort of insider um, perspective, which is often very critical, uh, often much more critical than the kind of press release perspective, if you like, um, is being made available um, and being made public. Um, so I think in that sense, blogs really do pr provide a, a, an important and, um, uh, and a necessary role. Um, but we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't think that they're. We shouldn't sort of romanticise them as being a, a sort of perfect or unfiltered or, um, or sort of pristine, um, pristine way of getting science out and getting good science out. Um, because the I would say the um, the downside of blogging uh, is that bloggers, as I've said, often have a particular um, interest and a particular uh, degree of specialization in the topics that they that they, that they write about um, and unfortunately that can go hand in hand with the uh, bloggers having an agenda so blogging I think is unfortunately is a very good way to um, to push uh, to push ideas good whether they're good ideas or bad um, and there are a number of blogs for instance which cover um, Climate change, and they basically repeat. You know, they, they just say that climate change is all rubbish, and they'll um, they'll blog about recent uh, climate change papers, and basically saying that they're all um, they're all uh, they're all wrong. Uh, there are blogs again about uh, vaccines. So the vaccine autism link um, is pretty much. Uh, there's there's very little research on it, but there's an awful lot of, of blogging going on about it, um, and on social media as well. Um, and there are other examples in which um, blogs are, as I say, a way to um, to continually push an idea, 
uh, for good or for bad. Um, and so, um, and how does that relate to our metrics? So there was, um, I think what it means is that we can't take, um, we can't take, let's say, Twitter mentions or blog mentions or um, or clicks as being um, as being, as it were, a good thing um, because they might represent, um, depending on the topic, they might represent um, the fact that something is being um, celebrated um, in circles that we would consider to be unscientific. So there was a paper on in Frontiers, I think it was Frontiers in Psychology, a couple of months ago about um, vaccines and autism. Um, as I say, one of the few pieces of actual research on it. And it got something like 35,000 hits within a few days, which is enormous and far higher than well, the average paper, I guess, in, in that journal will get like 500 hits or maybe 1,000 if they're lucky. So this got 35,000 very quickly. Um, and I'm sure that's because it was being shared on, uh, on these blogs where basically vaccines are kind of um, worse, than, uh, worse than poison and, you know, conspiracy theories abound. Um, so whether those clicks should be considered to be um, sort of genuine uh, contributors to impacts or whether they're, um, whether we ought to be uh, treating them separately, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly there's, as I say, there are, there are good blogs and, and bad. Um, actually, I think we can skip this uh, case study. Um, so, yeah, so I would say that overall blogging is um, uh, in some ways a bit like a cross between science writing and actual science itself. Many blog posts are, ver are sort of very informal um, or quirky in their, in their, their, their writing style, but in their content they're often much closer to being actual papers. And there are a number of examples of um, blog posts that have um, turned into papers, and I have a couple, um, which are here, um, Aaron and Mitty in Science, and um, Nine Circles of Scientific Health, started out as blog posts um, and were then um, published uh, as papers. And there's a couple of other ones here, um, these two ones blurred out at the bottom. Um, I've just blurred them out because they contain my real uh, identity, which is a pseudonymous blogger I don't want to... Um, um, don't want to share, but these are papers which I've published under my real name that started out as posts on my blog. Um, so, um, so blogging, as I say, is a real uh, crossover between science uh, and the mainstream media, and it has become a large part of the mainstream media. But we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't uh, put our heads in the sand and ignore the fact that many blogs are what we would many people would call unscientific or even anti-scientific. Um, but they but they make up a large part of the uh, the impact around certain um, certain papers. Um, that's uh, that's everything. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much, Neuroskeptic. It was really interesting to hear your perspective on this as well. Um, I'll just make myself the presenter now, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So if you have any, please do pop them in the question box, um, and we'll go through them shortly. Um, just on what you've both talked about, and Neuroskeptic, perhaps you could answer this first one. I'm really interested to understand a bit more um, about the impact that your work potentially has on the authors of the papers that you're writing about. Do you ever have much engagement with them? Do they tend to kind of comment on the blogs that you post, you know, particularly if you're talking about their paper, um, or, or what kind of relationship is there there? It's really, it's really varied. So the, um, it's some people, um, some people, I might blog about their work and then they'll just completely, they'll probably never, presumably never even read it, and so I never hear it from them. Um, I'd say that's probably most cases um, the authors don't engage. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you get um, you get people who really do engage uh, in the comments um, on Twitter, sort of coming back saying, 
either saying, you know, this is a good post that uh, I'm pleased with, with how you've characterized my work, uh, or saying, you know, I think this is misrepresenting um, uh, my work in some way, this is my response, that kind of thing. Um, so I'd say there's really a whole spectrum, um, a, but uh, a whole spectrum really from from no engagement to, to lots of engagement. Yeah. Okay, good to uh, good to know what's going on in the background. Well, interesting at least. Um, Rolf, there's a comment for you here. So one of our listeners has said that your um, comments about how readers like a scandal or posts that refute published results are really interesting. Do you think that the repu uh, I can't say that word re reproducibility crisis is mostly down to corruption, or is it just old-fashioned research practice? And do you think that the way that blogs or social media cover these stories could help promote open science and reproducibility, or is there a risk of villainizing honest scientists? Rolf, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, that we have already statistics about this, and it looks as if most of the lack of reproducibility is based on questionable uh, research practices. There are some indications that about up to 70% 70, 70 of psychology studies suffer from such uh, questionable practices. And I think it is the discussion that has taken place on social media and on blogs that ha has made the research community aware of this. And I think this is a, a, a good sign because psychology may now be a starting point for a revolution in science, for a kind of uh, uh, cleansing, because uh, there are now a lot of initiatives in, uh, already underway uh, to fight this problem. And I think this would not have happened without social media and blogs. Okay, thank you. Some interesting comments there. Um, another question that we've had from someone who I think perhaps is a blogger themselves has said, um, how do or should good uh, bloggers differ from the editorials that often accompany research in journals? So aside from the criticism of research design and statistical analysis, what do you think um, blogs bring that journal editorials that coexist alongside the papers don't? Um, Neuroskeptic, perhaps you've got some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, these editorials are often very good. I like them um, when I, when when you see them alongside a paper because often it'll make the paper understandable, not just to the general public but to other researchers who aren't sort of hyper specialized in that one field. Um, so I think they're doing an important job, and there are a lot of similarities with a blog post. Um, I guess the difference though is that the editorial can't be too critical. Because you can't really say, well, this, you can't say this paper's fatally flawed in, a, in an editorial which appears alongside the paper. Um, whereas in a blog post, you, have, you do have that freedom. So you're free, more free, I think, to say what you want to say. Uh, I think also blogs, in blogs, you get more of a chance to, um, how to put it, ex express yourself and link the research in question to, to, the, to the real world, um, kind of by, by, by bringing in, if it's relevant, bringing in discussions of like the news and, um, and popular culture and things, which you couldn't really, which would be considered to be too informal for a journal, but which um, I think are, are an important part of making things understandable and readable. Okay, good answer. Thanks very much. Um, we're nearly out of time. There's just a, a couple more questions that are really about the optometric side of things um, that I'll just answer. So um, one that we have had is, um, do we weight scores? We give each item that we track attention to what we call the optometric attention score, which is a, designed as kind of an indicator of the likely um, reach and volume of the attention that an item has received. So this person is asking, do we weight the scores so that a good, qual good quality blog will provide a paper with a higher score? Um, no, we don't. All blogs are scored the same. Um, so if you have a look on our support pages, we give the basic weighting there. 
um, and each blog will contribute the same amount. We do it by author, so if the same blog um, mentions the same paper more than once, it would still only contribute once to the score. And then the other question about altmetric tracking is how do we decide which blogs to track? Um, and this is really down to the, the ones that we hear about, to be honest. As I mentioned earlier, our tracking is fairly extensive already, but we're always open to new suggestions. Um, if you send them in to info at altmetric.com, um, we will take a look at them. Our only requirement is that they have an RSS feed because we need that to be able to do it technically. Um, and we also do, of course, check to make sure that they are actually writing proper things. They don't necessarily need to be blogs that focus exclusively on research, um, but we do like to make sure that they are good quality and, and not just posting spam articles or spam comments. Um, so please do send any um, suggestions that you have for blogs to us to track to support at altmetric.com, um, and we would be happy to take a look. Um, I think that's most of the questions for today, um, and so we'll wrap up there. But thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, do take a moment to check out Altmetric's own blog, of course. Um, we post a monthly high five of the research that has received the most attention in the last month. And we also regularly post about other issues that affect the scholarly community. So if you have a chance, do take a look. And then lastly, thank you so much to both of our great speakers. Um, apologies again for the issues at the beginning. Thank you both for holding the fort while I sorted things out here. Um, some really interesting presentations. And we'll send the recording around afterwards to everyone who's registered. So thank you both. Oh, thanks very much for hosting us. Thank you. All right. So Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.